President Salva Kiir declares a state of emergency in parts of South Sudan. Conservationists demand tougher enforcement against the criminal gangs behind the ivory trade. And could another American reality TV star be headed to Washington, D.C.? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now, South Sudanese President Salva Kiir has declared a three-month state of emergency in his home state where clashes have raged for months between clan-based militias. Information Minister Michael McCoy said on Tuesday the army will be given powers to stop the fighting in Gabriel state and that citizens' rights will be suspended. So far, President Kira has not announced which rights will be curtailed. According to local media, dozens of people have been killed in the fighting in the northern state. McCoy said the state of emergency also applied to the neighboring areas of Tunj, Wau, and the Whale East. South Sudan spiraled into civil war in December 2013, largely between soldiers and militia from the Dinka and Noor ethnic groups. The war has killed tens of thousands of people and displaced nearly four million people from their homes. Now, the United Nations on Tuesday is calling for the Libyan National Army, which controls the eastern part of the country, to investigate summary executions of prisoners. UN Human Rights voiced concern at the fate of those still in their custody. The Libyan National Army is pushing to expand its presence in central and southern Libya, where it has been vying for control with forces linked to the UN-backed government in Tripoli and other opponents. The Libyan National Army faced sniper fire on Monday during the attempt to take the last pockets of Islamist militants in Benghazi. The advance into central Benghazi neighborhoods is the latest step in, slow prog in the slow progress of the self-proclaimed LNA commanded by Khalifa Haftar, which has been waging a campaign against Islamists and other opponents in Libya's second largest city for more than three years. In East Africa, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta says his country will use deadly force against any su uh, suspected Islamic militants. Uh, the president sounded the warning on Monday while campaigning for re-election in Lamu, one of the regions that has borne the brunt of terrorist violence. In the latest uh, attack, suspected members of Somalia's Al-Shabaab terror group took a senior government official and five other people hostage in Lamu last Thursday. Two people died in rescue operation by Kenyan forces. Al-Shabaab members frequently launch attacks in Kenya, which they say are intended to force the country to withdraw its troops from Somalia. If someone has volunteered to come and destroy the lives of others, beheading them, killing our security officers, why would I beg him? We shall kill them as well. I have no apologies to make, none whatsoever. Well, President Kenyatta is facing a stiff challenge from opposition leader Raila Odinga. While high food prices are a major concern for his campaign in most parts of the country, security could be the leading issue for voters in the remote regions bordering Somalia. Now, the illegal ivory trade is decimating elephant populations across Africa. This week, delegates and activists from around the world are gathering in Switzerland for a meeting for, uh, of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, known as CITES. As Andrew Ridgewell reports, uh, activists want tougher enforcement of regulations to tackle the organized crime gangs behind the ivory trade, which is estimated at $23 billion per year. Shuidong in southern China, a hub investigators say for the smuggling of ivory poached from African elephants. Secretly filmed footage shows a network of safe houses where the goods are on display. An estimated 80% of ivory destined for China passes through Shuidong. This town has emerged as probably the biggest hub in the world for illegal trade in ivory tusks. We first came across uh, the, the, the footprint of this group in Tanzania in uh, 2014. The country has lost half its elephants in five years, the biggest loss in Africa. As Tanzania began to clamp down on smuggling, the gangs moved to Mozambique. Investigators secretly recorded one of the traffickers describing the trade through the Mozambican port of Pemba. We're able to move anything through Pemba. 
Everyone there has been bought up. The customs clearance agent. The customs also gets a share of the money. Investigators say the evidence shows smugglers operate with impunity. There was a few cases where they had some tusks seized, but they were never arrested. And they sort of saw these um, seizures as really a business expense rather than a, you know, a worry that you might get, might get arrested. Hong Kong authorities confiscated ivory worth $10 million earlier this month. China plans to ban the trade by the end of 2017. But John Seller, former chief enforcement officer at CITES, told VOA via Skype there is too much focus on the trade and not enough on the criminals involved. There is um, the speculation involved here that there is undoubtedly money laundering to, to my mind. This is a much more complex issue. Seller says CITES lacks the teeth to enforce to its regulations. Organised criminal networks are now major players in all forms uh, or many forms of, of wildlife trafficking. And you need to bring an organised law enforcement response to that. Without that enforcement, activists warn ivory poaching will likely continue until the criminal networks are investigated and dismantled. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Nobel laureate Malala Yousafzai is urging Nigeria to focus on improving its education system. According to government figures, nearly 10 million children do not attend school in the West African country. Yusuf Zai, a Pakistani education activist who came to prominence when a Taliban gunman shot her in the head in 2012, was named a UN Messenger of Peace in April to promote girls' education, addressing journalists in the Nigerian capital Abuja on Monday after meeting with the acting president and vice president Yemi Osinbajo. Yusuf Zai said the government should declare a state of emergency on education in Nigeria. The first one was to ask the government to declare a state of emergency for education because the education of Nigerian girls and boys is really important and the states, the government, the, the federal government and the local government, they all should be united for this. Secondly, uh, the spending, it should be made public uh, and, I, um, and, and thirdly, the uh, Child Rights Act should be implemented in all states. Yosef Zai has also campaigned to maintain awareness of the more than 200 school girls who were abducted in 2014 from the secondary school by the Boko Haram terrorist group. Minnesota's first Somali-American legislator, Representative Alhan Amar, visited VOA studios to discuss the current debate on immigration and our efforts to combat a missiles outbreak within the Somali community in Minnesota, along with the challenge of, of young Somalis in our state who may be at risk of radicalization. Viewers Salim Solomon has more. Um, do you believe your story um, and the story of Somalis in, in Minnesota uh, shows the value of accepting refugees? And if there's someone who'd say, you know, they believe refugees are a drain or even a threat to American uh, society, what's your response to that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we forget that for a really long time this place this country has been a place that has welcomed many refugees who um, have made it home have made the US home and have tremendously contributed to to this country and so it is not just about the successful story of of the Somalis <laughs> uh, in in the US but we have the stories of, of the Hmong and others who have come here who have made this country their home and we know uh, how much they're contributing to the societies that they live in. And it's unfortunate that, you know, when this is a, a country that, um, you know, often has a rhetoric that is about acceptance. Um, and, and now we are turning our backs on the most vulnerable people in the world. Solemnly swear or affirm that you will... In 2016, Ilan Omar made history when she was elected to Minnesota's House of Representatives, becoming the first Somali-American legislator elected to state office in the United States. Ilhan had humble beginnings as her family was uprooted from Somalia as a child during the country's civil war in the 1990s, and she came to America as a refugee after being resettled from a refugee camp in Kenya. Her story has inspired millions around the world, especially young girls.
One of Omar's challenges since taking office has been responding to a measles outbreak in the Somali community. Dozens of Somali children have contracted the disease, many of whom were never vaccinated due to false rumors about the adverse effects of vaccines. And so I sought after uh, funding for that, and we secured $5 million um, in, in this year's budget. Uh, to make sure that we are able to do some outreach and education in regards to measles and other um, infectious diseases. Omar has also worked to reach out to young Somalis who may be at risk of radicalization. Minnesota is home to the largest Somali community in the U.S. with more than 20,000 people living in the state. The Federal Bureau of Investigation said about a dozen Somalis have joined militant groups in Syria in recent years and about 22 men have been lured to join al-Shabaab in Somalia dating back to 2007. Uh, we know that a lot of these young people feel pretty angry and upset about something um, and avenues don't exist for them to have a, a discussion about what what's happening uh, with them they don't they don't feel like there is a process for them to do so and so um, and that isolation and that powerlessness that makes them vulnerable to being radicalized um, I think goes away and so so for me it's making sure that people understand that they have a lot more tools in their toolbox. That's Elhan Omar. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, Russian state-sponsored media continues to make inroads into the West. Stay with us. Hamilton Live is a live audience performance. With live music, you have that interaction. There's nothing like getting that immediate feedback from the folks that you're performing to. They feel it and they respond back to you. You see it in their eyes. You know that you're connecting with them. Like of any form of communication, it's that response that you get back. Well, Islamic leaders are urging Muslims to boycott a Jerusalem holy site after Israel set up metal detectors at the entrance of gates following a deadly Arab attack there last week. Now, the site is sacred to Muslims as the noble sanctuary and to Jews as the Temple Mount. An Israeli Israel police spokesman explains why the extra security measures are needed. Security checks as well as the metal detectors are being implemented in the area to make sure that there are no suspicious individuals making their way inside the Temple Mount. And we're continuing to make sure and guard the status quo on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount being open to Muslims who will go through security measures, open to visitors, tourists, as well as Jews. Well, the site was closed last Friday after three Arab Muslim citizens of Israel uh, shot and killed two police officers. The WA QF, Jordan's Islamic Authority, that manages religious affairs on the side, together with other Muslim groups, is calling on the faithful to pray in front of the gates of the mosque until the metal detector are removed. Well, the Russian government is funding international radio and television outlets to provide what it calls alternative news and views. Now, the state-funded radio Sputnik has recently opened an office here in Washington and began its broadcasts on July 1st. It follows the Russian English language television RT, uh, formerly known as Russia Today, that has had a bureau in the U.S. capital for several years. Sladitz Ahok discussed Russian media goals with a U.S. political analyst. Peter Yeltsov, professor of international security affairs at the National Defense University in North Carolina, was interviewed by Sputnik in Belgrade during last month's visit to Serbia. He says there is no doubt that its views are heavily influenced by the Kremlin. To give them a credit, they don't cut you, they talk to you. 
But at the same, the message and the questions is 100% pro-Kremlin, particularly on all the issues of the former Soviet Union, on Ukraine, on the Caucasus, on the, the European politics. It's just like basically like listening uh, directly to the press secretary of Mr. Putin. Yeltsov says Sputnik's Belgrade studio is upscale and conveniently located in the city center. They have a beautiful uh, studio in Belgrade, so they're definitely very well funded. They're in Starograd, in the, in the old city, and uh, they're very well staffed with people who speak several languages. Russian state-sponsored media reached their audiences through cable and satellite television, the internet and social media. The RT television network's feed is carried by satellites and cable to millions of households in about 100 countries. In addition to its international English language channel, RT has programs in Arabic and Spanish. Both Sputnik and RT have been accused of unethical practices. French President Emmanuel Macron says they work to influence the French presidential campaign in favor of his rival Marine Le Pen. Russia Today and Sputnik. Russia Today and Sputnik have been organs of influence throughout the campaign, and they've repeatedly produced counter truths about me and my campaign. Je vous le confirme à mon quartier général. But Sputnik editors and show hosts say their goal is to offer views and information missing from the established news media. In the mainstream media, you get the established people who kind of tout the establishment line, who go along with the current whatever the current pre-approved premise is. RT has interviewed Syria's President Bashar al-Assad and politicians critical of the European Union, such as Britain's Nigel Farage. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange hosted one of RT's past shows. The first guest on his show was the leader of the Iran-backed terrorist group Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. The controversial guests and programs seem to be attracting a growing audience worldwide. Yeltsov says most of them are people disenchanted by their government and mainstream media. He says there is no harm in hearing alternative views as long as people remember who is financing the programs and why. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, in recent months, Silicon Valley in California has been shaken over bias and harassment allegations raised by women in the industry. High-profile executives have left their firms, including Uber's CEO. The controversy casts a shadow of a unique part of the U.S. tech industry, the startup ecosystem. VOA's Deanna Michelle reports from San Mateo, California. This is no normal workout. More than 30 female venture capitalists, lawyers, and business leaders took part in an indoor cycling event to try to raise awareness about a problem that many feel has long been overlooked in Silicon Valley. How male venture capitalists perceive and treat female startup founders and employees. The spinning as protest is the brainchild of Tim Draper, a prominent venture capitalist. This is an exciting time for women, and I'm all for it, and I'm, let's go, let's start businesses. There's no, there's no glass ceiling if you start your own business. I think men have to be very important champions for women empowerment because to, the reality is that most decision makers today on the top political business leaders are men. So they have to be part of the, the change. Many women in Silicon Valley are telling their stories about gender-based discrimination faced when pitching ideas to venture capitalists who are almost always men and harassment they've received in a male-dominated industry. You pitch your idea. And they go, oh, that's really interesting. And it's, it was more like they were just setting up dates. Dent, a former model turned tech entrepreneur, says she faced harassment during conversations with a would-be advisor. What was I going to do, go to the police? Dent, instead, focused on Cinemers, the app she was creating for smartwatches. I fell deeply into a hole and didn't know what to do. And I learned a code. I decided, no, he's not going to win. The willingness of more women to publicly come forward, talking publicly and posting their experiences on social media, is making an impact on the venture capital industry. In the case of Uber, the company's financial backers ultimately pressed for the ousting of the CEO. You can use things like social media now and other many outlets we have, not just the courts, to communicate what we're all seeing uh, within the industry. And I think that's one of the biggest changes. By taking to social media, women are using technology to change the social construct of the tech world. Dina Mitchell in San Mateo, California, for VOA News.
Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, could another reality TV star be headed to Washington? We'll be right back. I'm Mil Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. And our correspondents will do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world. My name's Carla Babb and I work the Pentagon Beat. That access helps me to do better stories. Every day it's my responsibility to collect all of the defense news. It keeps our VOA viewers informed. I get to travel all across the globe. Anything that's defense related and how to protect and keep people safe, that's where I'll go. So it's never a dull moment at the Pentagon. My name is Carla Babb, this is my Beat. Welcome back to Africa 54. And here's what's trending. A new study suggests that sticking to a healthy Nordic style diet might actually lead to better cognitive health and reduce the risk of dementia in later life. The report by experts from Stockholm's Karolinska Institute adds to growing evidence that healthy diets help protect the mind. The diet identified many Nordic staples such as fat, rich fish, and poultry while steering clear of high consumption of root vegetables such as potatoes. It includes apples, pears and peaches. Rather than olive oil, which is dominant in the Mediterranean diet, the diet includes vegetable oils, mainly rapeseed uh, rap oil. Uh, the diet also has, has low levels of butter, margarine, sugar, sweet and pastries. Well, next up, uh, eco-tourism, ethnic tourism and the newest travel trend, Silk Road tourism. Now, tourism officials in the former Soviet Republic, uh, Republic of Kyrgyzstan are trying to attract more visitors to the country, promoting historic landmarks, traditional culture, and the ancient trading road of the Re uh, Silk Road. Now, with a history of nomadic herders, Kyrgyz people are trying to offer a traditional experience of horsemanship, competitions, and a life in nomadic felt tents called yurts. The lively traditional festival brought visitors from neighboring countries and some from far away as Sweden. According to the head of the Kyrgyz Tourism Department, some 3. Point, uh, rather 3, yeah, 3 .8 million foreign tourists visited the country in 2016. Well, and finally, Olympic gold medalist and former Kardashian patriot Caitlyn Jenner has joined the list of celebrities who say they are considering running for political office in the United States. Now, that's following the election of Donald Trump. Jenna, who, who as former Olympic champion Bruce Jenner, became in 2015 the most high-profile American to transition to a woman, says she will decide in the next six months or so whether to run for the Senate in California. Jenna, a Republican, said on a radio show that she is working with activist groups to improve the Republican Party's stance on lesbian, gay, and transgender issues. And that is what is trending today. Now, in a country where politics and economics seem to set apart communities, Americans are looking for ways to reconnect with the place they live. Away from trendy gyms, some martial arts can be the answer to find a place in society. A Brazilian martial art with African origins is playing an important role for some Washington DC residents. VOA's Myra Fernandez and Karina Chaudhry report. In 1890, Brazil prohibited capoeira. No one could practice, play, or teach it, and the threat of imprisonment, which lasted until 1937. In 2014, UNESCO declared capoeira intangible culture heritage, which translated into special protection. It integrates music, movements, dance, art, um, philosophy, and history all in one uh, form. And this kind of teaches a, um, a life philosophy. How to smile in the face of danger is how I put it. 
The music is uh, very hypnotic, powerful, and it just automatically grabs you the rhythms of the atabaki and the bit and bows and the, the depth of the, the slowness, the depth of the beat. It just, it, it just resonates. It moves something in your body. The music is great. You can really feel it in your soul, and when you sing along, you feel like you're a part of something greater and a part of something more. So it's not really uncommon for someone to start crying when they hear a song or to get goosebumps. So I, the music is, you know, almost the best part. <laughs> Once you start this, there's no going back because it's that seductive. It's so calming, it's strengthening, it makes you wise. There's nothing bad about Capoeira Angola. There's nothing to lose from doing Capoeira Angola. When I first started, I could barely hold a bed and bow. I could, I could lift a 60 pound dumbbell, but I couldn't hold a bed and bow for two minutes. And I learned to fall in love with it. Uh, when I'm not here, if I have two hours, I have four hours, I'm just playing. I get home from work and I grab my bed and bow and I play because it's, it's therapy. I like what somebody said one time, it, it, it teaches you how to deal with the positive and negative energies of day to day life. Um, Capoeira centers me. And that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. When something loses its original shape or form, it does not look very natural or comfortable. Bent out of shape. Hey, um, did you tell Greg about my dinner party? Yeah, I did. I thought he was invited. Well, now he's all bent out of shape because I didn't invite him. I'm sorry. 